Good evening, everybody. This is Tommy Rosen on the extraordinary forum known as intherooms.com. And it is my distinct pleasure tonight to be hosting and spend a little time with director Michael Botticelli. Director Botticelli is the White House Director of National Drug Control Policy. He has been in this position, uh, a position that he has inherited, um, been appointed by President Obama to, to deal with an enormous issue, uh, specifically addressing uh, the needs of people who suffer uh, around addiction and, and to set policy that will support people out of addiction onto a path of recovery. I, I don't wanna speak too much tonight. I want uh, to give Director Botticelli uh, as much time to speak as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and just simply uh, let him, uh, he has an introduction for all of us and he'll speak for about 10 moments and then we will have an opportunity to pose some questions to him which he'll then answer. Uh, Director uh, Botticelli, uh, I'm going to call you Michael for the purposes of this interview. Uh, in this forum, uh, I, I want you to know uh, this is a very, very special uh, opportunity for all of us. We consider you one of our own, uh, and people people here uh, have been following your work, and uh, you, you really are uh, tantamount to a hero uh, for many of the people here. So uh, it's very special for us to have you here. So I'm going to go ahead and put you in the box. When you see yourself in the box, everybody can hear you uh, and, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to share. So here we go. Thank you, Tommy, for that introduction and hello, everybody. I, uh, Tommy, I can't thank you enough for the introduction. As I often say, uh, you are my people too. Uh, and I feel so loved and supported by this community. Um, and, you know, as you know, I think one of the great things about the recovery community is that we have an obligation to give back and really want to thank you for your leadership and Ron and Kenny for your leadership and in the rooms and everybody who's on the call tonight. It's really a pleasure to be with you so that I can just share my thoughts and hear your stories and perspectives. You know, as Tommy talked about, I am fortunate uh, to have been in recovery for uh, over 27 years, and I've been working in this field for almost three decades. Um, sounds, I know, it's, uh, the years add up. Um, and as someone in recovery from a substance use, I want to tell you what you already know and that you are not alone. There are millions of us who are in recovery from a substance use disorder, and I'm so glad that you have In the Rooms community by your side. Uh, through my own personal journey and through my experience, I've learned something you have likely as well, that recovery is possible and that it can transform individuals, families, and even communities. I cannot tell you, of, you know, after so many years in recovery, I have never failed to be moved by someone's story and the power of transformation of recovery and redemption. It continues to move me and motivate me in the work that I do. You know, as part of that work, I'm charged with establishing and carrying out President Obama's drug policy. Uh, it's something that 27 years ago, I would never imagine that I would even uh, think about, let alone be doing. And so really, that's what I wanna talk about tonight, what we're doing to move our country and everyone with a substance use disorder, really from crisis to recovery. I think you know uh, the magnitude of the opioid epidemic that we're facing. And I'm sure you know people who have not been able to maintain their recovery and who have uh, unfortunately died as a result of an overdose. In 2014, more than 47,000 people died from a drug overdose. And on average, that's 129 people every day. And new preliminary data that came out last week suggests that that number rose to 140 people per day over the first six months of 2015. And 140 people per day, it's staggering and it's overwhelming. So we know that our country is facing a crisis and the administration's efforts are designed to end this crisis and help people live healthier and more productive lives. So our goal is to prevent substance use from beginning when we can, and for people who already have developed a substance use disorder to help them reach recovery. And our goals, we know that we can achieve this by expanding access to treatment, reducing the barriers to recovery, and ending the stigma that still surrounds people with substance use disorder. So right now, like no other disease, there's an enormous treatment gap for people with substance use disorders. It's estimated that only 12% of people who need treatment are actually getting it. Think about that. Only 12% of people with a disease are actually getting treatment. And there are many reasons why they are not. For some, it's because they are not seeking treatment. They don't think they need it. And in too many cases, it is because treatment is unavailable or they are still concerned about the stigma attached to having a substance use disorder. 
That's why the president has called on Congress for $1.1 billion in new funding in FY 2017 to expand access to treatment services, especially in underserved areas. Everyone who needs treatment should be able to access it. You know, I've spoken with hundreds of parents and family members across the country who have lost loved ones to overdose, and too many of them have shared similar stories about long wait lists for treatment or lack of good treatment options in their communities. And often their children died while waiting for treatment. That's unacceptable to the president, it's unacceptable to us, and it should be unacceptable to Congress. The president's budget would support prevention, treatment, and recovery services, which are essential parts of our national drug control strategy. The budget calls for providing grants to states for treatment and recovery services, assistance for veterans with substance use disorders, and recovery support services for people re-entering society after incarceration. We have to expand access to treatment before more people die preventable deaths. Another part of helping people reach recovery is reducing the barriers that they face. They include reforming our criminal justice system and making it easier to re-enter society after interactions interactions with law enforcement and the courts, especially in regard to employment. It's a sad fact that too many of us end up incarcerated and do not receive the treatment that we need. So we need to be diverting more people to treatment, including through drug courts and providing treatment to individuals in the correctional system. You know, President Obama says that America is a nation of second chances, and I am one of those people. This is a country that celebrates people who take the steps needed to overcome adversity. And our policies, our policies should reflect this. And we all need to celebrate those of us who've taken those opportunities and gone on to live healthy and productive lives. That's why he's called on Congress to ban the box on federal job applications because people's past shouldn't prevent them from having a future. Ending the stigma will also help us do that. And a key part of this is changing the words that we use. So, you know, we also know that language matters. And we know that when we use terms like addict and drug abuser to describe someone with a substance use disorder, they are less likely to receive quality health care. And this stigma carries over from medicine to housing and employment opportunities. We need to replace yesterday's words with uh, like addict and abuser with words that don't encourage stigma. We need to begin with the person, not the, the disease. You know, if you have chest pains or other conditions, your doctor orders tests. Treatment for substance use disorder should not be viewed as an afterthought, and it, not, it should not be considered second rate. For substance use disorders, access to treatment is literally a life or death matter. We can't wait until the disease reaches its worst point and overdose before op offering treatment. We don't do this for any other disease. As with any other disease, people with substance use disorders should have access to the full spectrum of services because everyone is different. The treatment that works for one of us may not work for the next. And this includes medication-assisted treatment. When used as part of a comprehensive approach that includes other counseling and support services, medication-assisted treatment is a proven method to help treat people with opioid use disorders and help them sustain long-term recovery. It's also the standard of care for people with opioid use disorders. Unfortunately, medication-assisted treatment is still not available in many places, and often because of the stigma and shame that still surround it. But you know, it's very similar to medication that's used to quit smoking. When someone says they're going to quit smoking, what's the first question they get? Often people ask, what medication are, are you going to use to help you stop? There's gum, patches, pills, and it's generally accepted that medication is a useful tool, if not a prime tool, to break a nicotine dependency. So telling our stories can help change this. You know, I meet people all across the country and I've heard countless stories, both heartbreaking and heartwarming, and I wanna tell you about a few of them. So in Ohio, I'll show you the picture. I met Krista, who told me about her brother, Jeff, and how an injury from a car accident uh, led down the path of misusing prescription pain medications and eventually heroin. Sadly, Jeff never recovered from his opioid use disorder. And in Connecticut, I met a woman na named Taisha uh, who shared a remarkable story. Taisha lost her mother at the age of 21. She became the legal guardian for her sister. Oh, sorry, I mixed up the picture. This one. <laughs> so Ta Taisha is an African-American woman in the middle. Uh, she lost her mother at the age of 21. She became the legal guardian for her sister 
who is on the autism spectrum, and she has two children. Taisha was taking opioid pills every day before she entered treatment. And when she did, she was able to access medication-assisted treatment and is now nearly four years into her recovery. And what's even better, she's now helping others, like many of us uh, who've taken our recovery and decided to give back. She went back to school to get a human services degree and is working at a women's halfway health house where she greets new residents and motivates them to sustain their recoveries. Taisha's story and no doubt many of your stories show people that recovery is possible. It's inspiring to hear people's stories of recovery and it helps encourage others to seek help and achieve recovery too. So as I always say, tell your stories, be open about the recovery process, help people see that addiction isn't an immoral failing, that's a treatable condition from which you can and from which people do recover. You know, there's more to this epidemic than just overdose and death. We need to give people help and hope and to let them know that they can recover. Um, it's really important for all of us uh, to the extent that we can and we feel comfortable to share our stories with anyone who's willing to listen. The more people understand this, the more we'll break down barriers and diminish the stigma. As I said earlier, our goal is to help people reach recovery and live healthier and more productive lives. If we can expand access to treatment, reduce the barriers to recovery, and end the stigma surrounding substance use disorders, I am confident that we will get there. But it's going to take everyone working together to move our country from crisis to recovery. As President Obama said in West Virginia last October, when it comes to substance abuse, treatment, and recovery, those things are possible if we work together and if we care about each other. So with that, I really want to thank you for what you do. I want to wish you well in your recovery, and I want to, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Michael. So grateful to have you here. We uh, reached out to the community over the past few days and we got uh, literally hundreds of questions, which we've ca culled down now to just a few. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'll put you back in the box so that you can answer it. Um, Michael, you have taken on this important role after four concentrated decades of drug control policy known as the war on drugs. You have stated openly your opinion that the war on drugs has been a total failure. I wholeheartedly agree. You're now reforming drug policy. What exactly does that mean? What is your vision for the future? Good. You should be in the box now. Okay, good. First time that I'm in the box, Tony. Uh, I, I like to think that I'm always out of the box. <laughs> um, but you know, for me, that means a number of different things. You know, I think that for a long time, you know, uh, we, because of our um, uh, misunderstanding about addiction uh, by um, looking at who it affected, um, you know, we had uh, formulated public policies and strategies that largely uh, treated people with addiction as um, kind of bad people who are doing bad things. And the vast majority of our response focused on punitive responses to substance use disorder. That's why our jails and prisons are packed with people uh, who are there largely as a result of their own substance use disorder. And, you know, I think we uh, can't underestimate the role that race uh, played uh, in our response to that. You know, the last time we had a huge epidemic uh, was really affected uh, African-American folks and people of color. Um, and our response to that was largely punitive. Um, and I like to think that we've learned a few things for, from, uh, from then that our scientific understanding of addiction as a brain disease uh, really came into play. Um, but I think we've also really learned that arresting and incarcerating people did little to reduce substance use, recidivism, and public safety issues. And it just led to over-incarceration and at great expense to the American taxpayers. Um, and we've learned that we can have a different response to that. You know, and I also think that this is where stigma comes into play. You know, um, there have been a number of studies that showed that kind of bad public policy is based on how we view people. And there have been a number of studies to show that when we view people with substance use disorders um, as uh, uh, um, uh, kind of moral failings and weak-willed people, that public policy flows from that, that they're light, less likely to uh, uh, think that um, treatment should be available to uh, everybody. 
So, so we, you know, we, I think, have continually uh, to uh, change uh, drug policy to make sure that we are really focusing on a, a more in-depth public health response to that. Um, you know, things like the Affordable Care Act, including a benefit, making sure that uh, substance use benefits are on par with other medical surgical benefits, continuing to work with law enforcement so that we are actually diverting people away from treatment. And in many respects, law enforcement has taken up the naloxone charge and are saving people's lives. So, you know, I'm really um, hopeful uh, that we will continue uh, you know, this trajectory where we are not viewing people with addiction as uh, kind of uh, uh, bad people, um, but people who have a disease and who are deserving uh, uh, of a therapeutic response. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, going now to a, a question that brings up a, a very complex and, and um, uh, hot topic right in this moment. At present, there's a significant emphasis on medically assisted treatment, which you, you referenced in your earlier talk. Um, this is including from your administration, from the current administration. Um, can you explain to people what medically assisted treatment really is all about and, and, and why, why is it such a big thing right now and your feelings about it? So, so Tommy, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we didn't hear you on this end, so if you could repeat the question, that would be helpful. Sure. I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, so this is this is a hot topic uh, and, and very relevant right now and, and a bit complex. And I know there are many people in this forum that don't necessarily understand what medically assisted treatment is. You referenced it in your earlier talk. So can you explain a little bit about medically assisted treatment? What is that? Why is it such a hot topic right now? And share some of your views on it. Um, it really is. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on it right now. Why is this? So, so a couple of things, and I, you know, I, I often feel. Okay, okay, great. Um, you know, I, I often feel awkward using the term um, medication-assisted treatment because it, by its very nature, you know, separate, uh, you know, creates this separate and distinct. Uh, treatment from overall treatment and recovery. So uh, until someone can think of another uh, better term, you know, I, I always hesitate to do that. But, you know, one of the things that I, I feel very fortunate about doing this work for a very long time is our scientific understanding about what is effective services has grown dynamically. And I think it's incumbent on those of us in the recovery community and those of us in the treatment field to really keep abreast of what the latest science and evidence says about not only what provides effective treatment, but what gets people to long-term recovery. You know, and the evidence is pretty clear that for people with an opioid use disorder, when they get access to a medication and when it's combined with other behavioral uh, supports and 12 and, and recovery supports like 12 step programs and, and uh, re you know, re recovery community services, that they do far better than those people uh, who are not on those medications. You know, and again, you know, it's not uh, dissimilar to tobacco, right? So, you know, probably about 10 years ago, we had very few therapies and people just basically had to kind of go it alone, grit their teeth, teeth and quit smoking. But what we found is that actually people who are on tobacco cessation medications, when they get other supports, do far better. And so, you know, I, 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 I uh, so part of our work is to ensure that people have adequate access to medication assisted treatment. You know, uh, too few health plans reimburse for all of the medications that we know that uh, um, there are not all of our treatment programs are offering it. And certainly uh, our criminal justice system uh, has a long way to go to offer these. So those have been one of our priorities to do that. You know, we are not saying that there is one definite pathway to recovery, but we want to make sure that people have adequate access um, to the full uh, arsenal of, of uh, uh, tools out there to, to do that. And, you know, what I, and I feel this particularly important as someone in recovery who found my recovery in 12-step groups, 
that, you know, I don't think that my path to recovery should dictate others' path to recovery, that we all have our own story and our own path to take. And we need to be supportive and embracing of everybody's path to recovery, whether that's with medications or without medications. You know what? Recovery is recovery is recovery, whether you're on medications or whether you're not on medications. And you know what? I just don't want to see people die uh, who have an addiction, and I want to make sure that they're living healthy and happy lives. So, you know, that's really my main goal in 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 promoting uh, the use of these medications. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, as you are all too aware, uh, shame and the the stigma of shame is remains a significant problem for those who would seek recovery, as well as those in recovery. And society still sees addiction as a result of a personal failing, uh, an addiction to drugs uh, other than alcohol or tobacco as a form of uh, criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. What can we do to better address these issues, shame and the stigma around this disease that hinder the recovery process for so many people? You know, that's a really important issue because, you know, we can have all the treatment and recovery support services that we want, but fundamentally, if people are too afraid to ask for help because of the shame and stigma, it's really inconsequential. And I think there are a number of things that we can do. You know, when, when you look at over the history of, of highly stigmatized people and highly stigmatized diseases, one of the most simplest things that we can do is come out about our own recovery. That, you know, when we come out about our recovery, we fundamentally change the way that people view people with addiction. When they know someone, they're much more likely to be supportive, not only of that person, but of good public policy. You know, and we see time and time again how some of the stigma and stereotypes around people with addiction lead to fundamentally bad public policy and discriminatory practices. So, you know, I, I think, and, you know, I'll speak for myself, that as a person in recovery, I do feel like I have an obligation and I would encourage you to kind of, you know, do the same process of, of coming out about my recovery because I think it's really important for uh, those of us uh, who can, and I know that not everybody's in a position to do that and I don't want people to place their lives or their family or their work in jeopardy, but I think those of us who can have an obligation to speak up because it fundamentally changes our view, people's view about who we are and leads to better public policy. I think another thing that we can do is change our language. And, and I do feel like those of us in recovery have a particular responsibility to do that. You know, I, I've often said that, um, you know, language matters. And, you know, there's been research to document um, that when we use terms like drug abuser or addict, that it elicits a much more punitive response for people and continues to perpetuate stereotypes. And so, you know, I'm very um, conscious that I don't use my 12-step language, how I talk to my friends in recovery, in um, in advocating. Um, so I might call my friend, uh, you know, an addict or a junkie or a drunk, but but that's not appropriate and doesn't help our overall advocacy. So so I think you know one of the things that we're trying to do is get people to change the language um, of how we refer to people with substance use disorders. I think it's one of the simplest things that we can do to really diminish some of the shame uh, and stigma that still exists. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, recently, Michael, we, we um, experienced the tragic loss of the artist, the beloved artist, Prince. This really underlined the dangers of opiate use. Um, what would be your three best prevention strategies to prevent opioid use, thereby uh, decreasing heroin and fentanyl-related uh, deaths? So thanks, and I, I think his death is, you know, is a reminder of the magnitude of the ep epidemic that it, you know, it doesn't know geographic boundaries, it doesn't know racial boundaries, doesn't, uh, it doesn't know economic boundaries, you know, and, and as I said before, you know, his death that day represented perhaps one of 140 people who died that day of an overdose. So I think we have to remember not only Prince, but the other people uh, who didn't get the headlines who died that day, that those are important people to remember. But I think it says to me a couple things. One is our focus on primary prevention. You know, we know probably all of us, you know, understand that addiction is the disease of early onset and that the early people start using, that's my story, probably many people who are watching, you know, started at a very young age, 
Um, and so we need to focus on primary prevention so that, you know, no one uh, has to go down this path. But I think particularly on the opioid issue, you know, we've got to rein in um, over prescribing uh, that's been happening. I, you know, I, and I'm sure many people are online, you know, have their own stories. And, you know, I have my own story of, you know, a medical person who knew I was in recovery, knew I had a history of substance use and still prescribed me opioids. Um, and I'm sure all of us have shared similar stories. I talked to many people in recovery who've gone through the same process. And that's largely because our medical community knows little about addiction and knows uh, little about pain prescribing. So we have been calling for mandatory prescriber education uh, to rein in prescribing and to make sure physicians are doing simple things like asking people if they have a history of substance use uh, issues before they prescribe anything and actually getting them to prescribe non-opioids for pain management strategies. You know, I think the other piece too is, you know, I go back to expanding access to treatment is probably the other biggest thing that, you know, I, again, I hear uh, too many stories that when people are finally ready uh, and they are asked for help, they're not able to access it largely because they can't afford it or their insurance doesn't cover it. So, so we need to make sure that we are uh, um, really, I think, calling on Congress to make sure that they're stepping up to address this epidemic in really fundamental ways and, you know, and supporting the president's budget uh, to expand treatment in the United States. So, you know, there's a lot more issues I think we could work on, but those are probably the kind of some of the three, I think, key things that, that we are focusing on as it relates to the opioid epidemic. Thank you for that answer, Michael. Um, can you share your position uh, on the legalization of marijuana? Uh, such a such a complex issue. Um, people are. It's funny with with marijuana. People are not. Uh, there's nobody sort of agnostic on this issue. Everybody has a, a, pr a pretty powerful opinion one one way or the other. I'd love to get your opinion for this forum. Um. Good. So you know, I, and I'm one of those people that you know is probably not neutral about it either, Tommy. As you know, uh, and, I, and I'll talk about this in two ways. One, you know, as my role here in ONDCP, and second, as a person in recovery. So, so first of all, you know, our administration does not support the legalization of marijuana. You know, I, you know, we, we don't want to see people arrested and have lifelong criminal records for simple marijuana possession. But I don't think the legalization of marijuana is going to solve issues of disproportionality in our criminal justice system. And I think we're going to see, and we are beginning to see, some of the uh, negative public health impact around, uh, around marijuana. Uh, so, you know, I don't think that um, from a public health standpoint, uh, legalization is the, our, our path forward here. But, but, you know, also as a person in recovery, so it's interesting, I just had a bunch of people over to my house uh, uh, yesterday for a barbecue. Some were in recovery, some were not, and we were talking about those issues. And to a person, both those of us in recovery and uh, those who love us, we're talking about the fact that wherever they go, uh, we live obviously in Washington, D.C., where uh, it has been legalized, where, wherever we go, whether that's parks or walking down the street, that the smell of marijuana is pervasive. And I think, you know, all of us online know, you know, particularly in early recovery is really hard. And while, while we're fundamentally responsible for our own recovery, we should have the right to live in communities that are safe and healthy and support our own recovery. You know, and, you know, honestly, I don't want to be walking down the street and be, you know, um, uh, be assaulted by marijuana smoke everywhere I go. And so, you know, I, well, while I understand kind of people's, um, you know, uh, issues around disproportionality and criminal justice. I think we also want to have communities that are ha uh, that are healthy and that promote and support those of us in recovery. I think we have that right as well. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, we've already come uh, nearly to the end of our time, and I want to be very respectful of yours. Uh, I'm not sure if you fully realize uh, you really are a symbol of hope. You are truly a symbol of hope, and you're you're an example of victory um, at the personal level and 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 in a more visible kind of way. Can you give uh, a personal uh, uh, statement uh, to people who may be watching this, who are either stuck in addiction, or they're on a path of recovery and maybe thinking, "Gosh, this isn't really working for me," and I I, I thought there was something more. Um, 
can you give a, a little statement of hope um, for the person who is still sort of on the fence and still struggling with this disease? Thanks, Tommy, for that. You know, I, you know, despite the fact that, you know, kind of my position is a little unique, you know, I've, I've often said that, you know, my story is not unique, that I, you know, represent millions of people in recovery who've been happy and, you know, who've gone on to live uh, and, and get a life second to none. And, you know, um, if, if, you know, if I can be any inspiration, um, you know, I think we all know that it gets better, that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, one of the things in, from the, you know, the, uh, promises of the big book that I always turn to for inspiration, you know, um, said you will have a site, a life second to none. And, you know, I absolutely feel that way. And, you know, um, I, I, I just can't tell you like how, um, humble and grateful I am to be in a position where I can use my voice, uh, to, you know, hopefully make it easier for the next person. But whether you're in a, a job like mine, whether you're a recovery coach, or whether you're just a person in recovery, I think we all have the power um, to be in the world, words of William White, a recovery carrier. That I think we all have the ability to inspire recovery in other people simply by living our lives and showing people what the possibilities exist when uh, when you're in recovery. So, you know, thank you for saying that, you know, I hope that I inspire people, but we all have the potential to inspire people. That if we use our individual and collective voice, we, we can, and I believe we are changing the way people think about people with addiction and the way that people see recovery. And I am just, you know, thrilled to be in this job at a time when I see this huge recovery movement um, and and this site is helping to change that and not only support people in recovery, um, but really to create a movement. And, you know, I am thrilled. You know, the nice thing about my job is I am joined by many, many people who are in prominent positions in the federal government who are in recovery. And, you know, our ability to, you know, to to use our voice and to really affect public policy um, is amazing to me. So, you know, uh, again, I, you know, I, 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 I feel tremendously grateful uh, for uh, not only being here tonight, um, but, um, you know, uh, getting to be one of the millions of people in recovery who uh, can make a difference. Well, we have been speaking with Director Michael Botticelli, uh, Director of the White House Director of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, Michael, on behalf of everybody here at In the Rooms and all the millions of people who are directly and indirectly affected by your work, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for blazing a trail towards a more humane and compassionate national drug policy. Uh, we're grateful. Um, we, are, uh, we are the wind at your back and keep doing the great work. We love you very much and we're grateful for your work. And uh, we hope that we get to uh, chat with you every now and then like this. Um, when it's appropriate to do so. <laughs> so thank Great. you, Michael. Great, thanks, a, thanks everybody. All right, have a wonderful night. You too. Okay, bye-bye.